English Reformation, uh, parentheses, S, Reformations. Uh, so I did want to let everybody know a little bit about how I set up the class. So the English Reformation is a huge topic. So I am going to mostly focus on it um, through a political and religious lens. I'm not going to go too much into the doctrine itself because it does move so much over the course of the time. But what I really want you to do is we're going through the English Reformation and how it takes place is try not to think about it as a modern person who knows how it all ends, but think of it more as if you were a person living there. Uh, and going through this, uh, because what I really want to convey to people is just the chaos and confusion and the constant shifting. Because if you think about it, from the beginning of the English Reformation, where Henry decides he doesn't want to be married to Catherine of Aragon, until the last of Elizabeth's laws settling, this is what the Church of England believes, it's less than 40 years. So there are people who saw the entire series of events that we're gonna go over happen in their lifetime. And so if you end up feeling a little confused at the end, I'm gonna tell you that's by design uh, rather than just the absolute chaos of the English Reformation. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of both. Um, the other thing, I do want to let you know a few notes is some of you probably are aware the way the calendar worked changed. So sometimes on the years, the year used to begin in March. Uh, so sometimes the years are a little fuzzy. Just, just go with it. I see I'm getting chats. So is there anything essential going on over there? that I need to know about. Um, somebody wanted to know what the role of cats in the Reformation was. Um, the role of cats, um, they knocked things off uh, just like they do now. That's their main role. So um, I'm showing you this now not to take note, but to point out to you as I'm showing you images um, in the handout, there is this list of source codes. So you can see what museum or castle or whatever a particular image is located if you wanted to go find it. Um, so I'm gonna frame this class. Um, one of the big historians of the English Reformation has basically said that it's easier to think about the Reformation as a series of three reformations. Um, the first one, which is gonna feel like it takes like more than half the class is gonna be the Henrican. Um, that's Henry VIII's reign from the time he decides that he actually wants to do this. Um, and that ends up getting reversed mostly by the end of his reign. Uh, a lot of the changes aren't permanent. Um, then the next is the Edwardian. Uh, so this is the reformation that occurs during Edward VI regency. And then that's mostly reversed by the Marian Restoration, which is the reign of Mary I. And then the final of the three reformations is the Elizabethan, which occurs in the earlier part of Elizabeth's reign, and that is not reversed. We're gonna go further than 1563 though. A lot of historians cut off there because that's when a lot of the doctrine is settled, but the chaos that's caused by the English Reformation continues through her reign. Um, so we're going to go deeper in than just through there. So if you look at the handout that you have, if you downloaded it, you might not need it here, but you'll probably want to take it home. Um, you'll see a lot of the information is on the, sl on the slides is on there. You will also then see, like I said, I've given you a cast of characters, um, including basically a Tudor extended family tree that you can follow. 
um, because it's really going to help later to see how some of these people are related to each other. Um, I've given you the source codes. I've given you a bibliography. Um, and then in addition to the Tudor family tree, I have some other important people that we're going to talk about. I have cut a lot of names that you don't absolutely need to understand the basics because there are just too freaking many names. The other thing I am going to consciously try to do is rather than talk about the nobility based on their title, because a lot of times you'll hear like the Duke of Somerset rather than what his actual surname was. Well, the surname makes the familial connections much clearer. So I'll give you both and emphasize the surname because there were a lot of things that didn't make sense to me until I went, oh, well, that's why he cares about that. That's his kid. So we're going to start off uh, the Henrican Reformation. So this is the reign of Henry VIII. Um, so in the period, if you're ever hearing anything about, if you're reading anything about Henry VIII's desire for his annulment, Henry's the only one who thinks it's annulment. Everyone else knows it's a divorce. Henry's annulment from Catherine of Aragon, it will be referred to euphemistically as the king's great matter. That's what they're talking about. So we're going to attack the question of why does Henry want an annulment? Why is he obsessed with having a son? But to do that, I need you all to step into the Wayback Machine even further. So we're going to go back to 1501. In 1501, Henry VII is king of England. And his son, Arthur, the Prince of Wales, has is just married to this lovely young princess, Catherine of Aragon from Spain. And at the moment, Henry is a little kid. Um, so you've heard of the heir and the spare. In 1501, Arthur is the heir. Our future Henry VIII is the spare. The problem is within a year of marrying Catherine, Arthur keels over, he dies. And so suddenly Henry has the, Henry VII has the problem of his spare is now his heir. And he has this lovely young Spanish princess um, that he likes the alliance that came with Spain and some of the benefits from having her. Um, ha his son Henry's a little too young to get married to Catherine yet. And there's a problem because at this point, um, the general scriptural interpretation is that you're not supposed to marry your brother's widow. But Henry VII says, you know, I really want to keep this, this Catherine around. Um, I really want to marry her to my son. Hey, Pope, can I get a dispensation saying that even though Catherine was technically married to Arthur, um, it's okay for her to marry Henry. And the Pope says, sure, no problem, fine with me. Now this Pope is not gonna be the same Pope that we're gonna mention any other time. Um, I'll mention other Pope's names. The problem I had with listing out the Popes of the 16th century is they are dropping like flies. There are like 18 Popes over the course of the 16th century. Some of them don't even last a month. So if the Pope sounds inconsistent, at any point in this class, that's because it's probably not the same guy that we just talked about because it'll be a new Pope. So Pope in 1501 says, sure. Actually 1502 says, sure. Henry can marry Catherine when he's old enough. In 1509, uh, Henry VII keels over. Henry VIII, well, Henry becomes Henry VIII. He marries Catherine of Aragon. And things go along very nicely for more than a decade. But remember, they got a dispensation from the Pope for her to marry him. So while Henry and Catherine are happily married over here in England, I want to remind you in 1517, the Reformation 
kicks off in Wittenberg in Northern Europe. Uh, this does not have a huge impact on England, particularly because the Protestant ideas that do manage to make their way to England, Henry and his advisors and churchmen actively suppress. In fact, in 1521, Henry has so impressed the Pope with his denunciation of Martin Luther that he in fact is awarded by one of the Popes the title Defender of the Faith. That guy's dead by the time the next part of the story happens, but I'm pretty sure he probably rolled in his grave. Because, so we get a little further along. And the problem we have now is that Catherine has gotten older and she hasn't had a son for Henry. They have one child, uh, which is the Mary. I put up a por nice portrait of her here in uh, red and orange. And Catherine has had, in addition to Mary, five other pregnancies. Um, she did have one son who lives 52 days. Uh, and then after Mary, she has a series of at least four more miscarriages or stillbirths. And remember, Catherine is several years older than Henry. She was intended to be his brother's bride, who was several years older than him. It gets to the point by the mid to late 1520s where Catherine's probably not going to have another successful pregnancy. And Henry realizes this. Um, and by the way, part of the reason I don't have a baby portrait there of Mary is because you only get your portrait painted if you're important. And as we're about to discuss, Mary wasn't that important at the time. So part of the reason Henry is obsessed with his son and why Mary is not important. Um, so at this time in history, England has never had a true queen regnant. They technically had Matilda, Empress Matilda, for about six weeks in the 12th century. They've never had a queen uh, successfully reign. Uh, there are some examples in other places, but they're England. You know, they're the best. Um, so there's fear of a woman as a ruler. And of course, along with that is all of the expectations of a woman, which you'll see come up again later with Mary and Elizabeth, of if a woman is supposed to be subordinate to her husband, well, then how can a woman serve as the head of the country? Uh, so you've got that preference for a male heir based on the views of the society. Um, England has gone by, you know, male primogeniture. It's the eldest son. So we have that going on. Uh, in addition to that, we don't just have the fear of a woman as a ruler, but we have, Henry has a fear of a weak ruler because, sorry if this gets a little fuzzy, Henry knows from his father and from other relatives what happens in England if you have a weak ruler. He has the example where his father finally took control. Um, so I, what I want you to notice is this is partially to demonstrate that Henry VII's claim to the throne was a little bit shaky um, because what you have here is what Henry's afraid of. So you had Edward the Black Prince die off and then there were all these conflicts over who is the next rightful heir. And all those red dotted lines are people being deposed. So you become king and then some other relative knocks you off. So, and what is this part of? This is the War of the Roses. So not in Henry's conscious memory, of course, because he's born after it, but in the cultural memory that he's dealing with, he knows that a weak ruler 
with a less legitimate claim to the throne leaves England in threat of there being chaos. And he doesn't want that. He wants a strong legacy. The other thing he has is, as an example of a weak ruler, is what happened over here with Edward V. Edward V is a child. Um, his uncle becomes his regent, and then, poof, Edward disappears and is never seen again. So Henry's fears are not unreasonable for the time and the culture. Um, he is concerned that he's not going to have this strong male heir that's going to be able to carry on and prevent something that looks like this. The other thing is if he doesn't have a strong male heir, here's the big family tree. And some of these people, of course, are not born yet. We'll get to them. But if there's not a strong male heir to take over, look at all these other distant relatives who could get involved in one of those conflicts over the throne. And we'll get to them later for the conflicts we have later. Look, right here's Mary, Queen of Scots. You know, this whole idea of once you don't have a clear line of succession, throwing everything into chaos. There's the problem of legitimacy. Um, so Henry even toys for a little bit with what about his illegitimate son? So the unknown woman on the one side, the theory is she could be Bessie Blunt, who is a mistress of Henry's, who has a son with him. Uh, this is Henry Fitzroy. And yes, they have misspelled Duke in such a way that it is Henry Duck, which is only a side note of why I love this painting. But so Henry's had a son and he does appear to toy with even, hmm, can he make his, the son strong enough that even though he's illegitimate, he can make him his heir. Um, this is solved, of course, because uh, Henry Fitzroy doesn't actually live that long. Uh, but Henry takes the unusual step of actually acknowledging this son publicly, much I'm sure to Catherine's humiliation, and creating him the Duke of Richmond and the Duke of Somerset, excuse me, and the Duke of Somerset, and has this big thing at court and gives him all sorts of titles. So that is the other thing is Henry is weighing his options. He's not quite sure what he wants to do. He, he believes he desperately needs a son of some kind, preferably one of his body. And this is all happening before Anne Boleyn comes along. But Anne Boleyn comes along and then ideas that Henry has been toying with and trying to figure out what to do and how does he handle it well, this accelerates everything. Um, it's fair to say Anne Boleyn is not the cause of what happens next, but she's the catalyst. She is the thing that is suddenly thrown into the mix that makes Henry decide to act. And Henry says, okay, now I have this beautiful wo young woman that I am crazy about. At least Henry thought she was beautiful. So he calls uh, Cardinal Wolsey, who is his chancellor. And he says, Okay, Wolsey, you know, we've talked about this before, um, that I'm not sure what I need to do about not having a son. Um, I need you to get me a divorce. Well, actually, he says, I need you to get me an annulment. Wolsey nods. And like I said, everybody knows it's not an annulment. It's a divorce. Yes. Yes, your majesty. I'll get you your annulment. Wolsey tries for two years to get this annulment from the Pope. And here's why he doesn't get it, but it gets dragged out. So the current Pope that we're dealing with at this point is Clement VII. So Clement VII, in the, in, up here, we have him on horseback. Over here in this image, we have him on one side of Charles V. 
So we need to explain who Charles V is and why his being associated with the Pope means Henry doesn't get his annulment. So Charles V, um, who is the all-time winner of the Strong Chin Award, if you ever go look up some portraits of him, Charles V is the Holy Roman Emperor. He is also Catherine of Aragon's nephew. So Henry and Wolsey start out this annulment thing quietly and secretly. They go to do this without telling Kath, you know, trying to keep it under the radar from Catherine that they're trying to give her the boot. But Catherine has loyal people in the court and she has spies and it gets back to her. So she lets her nephew know. So Clement VII, the Pope, is now, he has to come up with a decision because it's not impossible to get a divorce in this time, especially if you're powerful. The Pope has granted them before. It's happened. But Charles says, I don't think you should let him divorce my aunt. And Charles is sitting in Europe, you know, just outside of Rome with his armory, with his armies. He spends most of his reign as the Holy Roman Emperor in wars of some kind or another. So this is the guy right outside your gate saying, I don't think you better give the King of England what he wants. The King of England is across the water on an island. Who do you think Clement VII is more worried about keeping happy? So he drags it out forever. I mean, he sends a, a papal legate to England to have the hearing there. And, and it takes the guy like six months because he's old and he has gout. So it takes him forever. So the Pope's dragging it out, dragging it out. Guy gets there, finally gets to England. You know, can, can we have can we have a discussion about this today? Nope, nope, my gout's acting up. Can't do it. Finally, Clement gets to the point where he says, No, you can't have it. You can't have the annulment. You don't get it. At which point Henry fires Woolsey for not getting it done. And he brings in a new friend. He brings in Thomas Cromwell. And by the way, this is where we get to they're all Thomases. So we just had Wolsey. Now we're going to have Cromwell. And Cromwell and his advisors, one of whom we're going to talk a lot about is, is uh, Thomas Cranmer, who's the Archbishop of Canterbury. They finally come up with the idea of, and they play around with some different options. They try to do things to maybe uh, push the Pope, intimidate the Pope, say, hey, you know, you don't want to lose all of England, do you? And they finally decide, well, hey, Henry, if you're head of the church, then you can grant your own annulment. And that solves all your problems. So Cromwell gets to work on this. And then in 15, late 1532, Anne Boleyn is pregnant. So we've gone from we need to get this done really soon to we need to get it done right now because we need this child, in case it's a boy, to be legitimate. So Cromwell says, it's okay. And part of what I want you to see here is this isn't all it wants. This is little tiny things, little tiny pushes. So Cromwell writes up a petition of grievances against the Catholic Church. And this is where you'll start to see me refer to the Catholic Church versus, it'll be abbreviated, C of E, Church of England. So he comes up with, it's this thing called the supplication against the ordinaries. And this is basically a list of, this is our grievances against the Catholic Church. And he brings it into the House of Commons in Parliament. And bringing it up there, they, they pass basically this petition, which forces the convocation of Canterbury. The convocation, it's basically a big meeting of the bishops. 
and at the Convocation of Canterbury, uh, Edward Fox, the Bishop of Hereford, presents this series of basically the king's demands. Um, and what the king wants is he wants the church to give up the authority to make church law, which are referred to as canons, without royal permission. So you can still make church law, but you have to get my approval as the king first. Uh, he wants to force them to submit any existing church law to a committee that will be appointed by the king. Um, that committee is going to be half members of parliament and half clergy, and they're going to have the ability to avoid any of the existing church law that Henry doesn't like. And then they'll retain only the church law, excuse me, that Henry considers acceptable. So he hasn't said, hey, I'm in charge, I'm in ahead of the church yet, but he's pushing. He's pushing to say, I should get veto authority over the church decisions. Uh, and then the next thing he does is, it's based, is the other thing's all about money. So um, there were payments that would need to go, that would go from the clergy to the papal treasury, basically. It was expected that you would send a certain amount annually. It was kind of like tithing of, you know, you hold this office, you get so much money from it, you send so much of that to Rome, to the Pope. So we have an act to do away with that. And in the same act, um, so normally when you choose a bishop before this point, um, the chapter gets together and they elect a bishop. Well, you're still going to get together to elect the bishop, but the king's going to write you a letter and tell you which one you're going to elect. So you get the appearance that it's still an election, but the king is choosing the bishops. So again, it's, it's little pieces of taking away church power and authority and their money too. So this one's really important, the Ecclesiastical Appeals Act. It's another Cromwell piece. So they make up a bunch of, they make up a bunch of crap and interpret a bunch of crap to say, England is an empire and therefore it's an imperial crown. Um, and they do all sorts of finagling to basically take England all the way back to Rome, uh, back to the Roman era. Um, and that means that if they're an empire, they shouldn't be subordinate to anyone else. So that means that the crown is the final legal authority for everything, whether it's lay, sorry, that shouldn't, instead of legal, that should be lay or ecclesiastical. And there is no ability to appeal to any outside authority because the king is the final authority, meaning you can't appeal to the Pope. And what that means is, if Henry says, I want a divorce, there is no higher power that Catherine can appeal to. And that's a huge one. Um, basically, he's, they're saying, the Pope, you no longer have any authority over any decisions here in England. And then we'll just, you notice I put in some of the the uh, actual titles of the laws, if I could find them, but we'll simplify them. The Ecclesiastical Licenses Act. So any payments going to Rome that were still left after we abolished those other ones, those are gone too. Um, the Peter's Pence, particularly that is mentioned in the title, uh, the Peter's Pence was actually a collection of money from lay people. It was a certain amount that all the landowners would contribute that would go to Rome excuse me, and it gave the Archbishop of Canterbury the power to issue dispensations. So we all remember the Pope had to give the dispensation uh, for Henry and Catherine to marry. Now the Archbishop of Canterbury can do it. Those are dispensations formerly granted by the Pope. Yeah, who, and remember now, who nominates the archbishop 
the king. So with this power, the Archbishop of Canterbury now can grant Henry his divorce. And that's exactly what Thomas Cranmer does. He says, fine, now I can issue dispensations. Oh, and he also gets to set the fees and the fees come to hit, come to the, you know, the, crown, the Church of England and the crown rather than, than going to Italy. So now Thomas Cranmer gives the divorce. And then we're going to come to the crown, the crowning glory, ha ha ha, of all of this. So the act of supremacy, and this is my extremely technical little uh, chart that I built for you. Because what I want to emphasize is all Henry has done with the act of supremacy is changed the top of the structure. So this is the basic structure of the Catholic Church as it existed prior to and after the act of supremacy. He doesn't change the rest of it. He just says, instead of the Pope at the top, it's the crown, at, crown of England at the top. So that act of supremacy says that the crown is the only supreme head on earth of the Church of England. And therefore he gets all those honors and everything that previously would have been the privilege of the Pope, those all go to Henry as the crown. Note the use of the term head, that's gonna change later um, because we'll have women. So, but then even more than I'm the Supreme head of the church, the, uh, it is treason not to recognize the act of supremacy. So at this point, like I said, Cranmer gave Henry the divorce. He then does the legal confirmation of the marriage of Henry and Anne Boleyn, who have already married in secret. And he crowns Anne Boleyn and anoints her and everything and recognizes her in queen in time for the delivery of crap. It's a girl. Needless to say, Henry is not as excited as he could be, but Anne is young, relatively speaking. So with confidence, Henry says, that's fine. Surely we will have more children together. And he gets Parliament to pass the first Succession Act. And the first Succession Act, because there's more coming, says Catherine of Aragon and his daughter, Mary, is illegitimate. She's out of the line of succession. Makes the children of Henry and Anne Boleyn next in the succession. Right now, that's just Elizabeth, but he's confident that's going to change. And it requires his subjects, if commanded, to swear an oath to recognize the Succession Act and the supremacy. So it is treason with this and the Treasons Act just to deny that the king is the head of the church or that Elizabeth is not next in the line of succession. Um, and I gave you, here is actually the oath of allegiance that Henry requires of basically his nobles and a little quote from it. So he, he doesn't necessarily make the individual, you know, individual normal people swear an oath, but he makes a whole bunch of the nobles swear the oath of allegiance and sign saying, yep, you are head of the church now. And I recognize your marriage to Anne Boleyn is valid and Mary is illegitimate and Elizabeth is legitimate. Well, and here, here I, love, I love myself some good uh, 16th century propaganda. So here is some, here is a woodcut that comes 
later in the century demonstrating for you. So here is Henry sitting on his throne. Um, this poor guy down here that you can see, this is Clement. This is Pope Clement VII. So this is the Pope with Henry's foot on his back. Um, they even label him so you know who it is. Uh, I believe that is supposed to be his papal mitre on the floor uh, and his staff. Um, they've la helpfully labeled that this is Cranmer and Cromwell over here uh, helping Henry with everything. And you have these, you know, like some of these poor religious over here crying. So, oop. so just an idea of we do immediately get some fun propaganda out of it. So at this point, Henry has said, I'm head of the church. I got my, I got my divorce, which is what I wanted. I got to get remarried. And we also get out of this our first martyrs. So there's going to be a lot of martyrs. We're not going to go through all of them, but I wanted to bring up these two. Um, because Thomas More, who was one of Henry's important advisors, and uh, Bishop John Fisher, um, both basically refused to take the oath. Um, and you get martyrs. And you get in a di you get more propaganda because here we are, martyrs. Now the a lot of these uh, martyrdom woodcuts and stuff are actually and engravings are actually made a little later, more towards when we get to Elizabeth, and you'll see the reason for that. Uh, but martyrdom is a big thing. Uh, we'll talk a little later. We'll have images from something that's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. So Henry doesn't do a whole lot more necessarily with some of these things about the Reformation. He kind of got what he wanted, but Cranmer and Cromwell take off. Um, they've been given leave by the king to do this, and they start pumping out along with a couple other members of the clergy, um, but they're really kind of leading the charge. Um, there's something called the injunctions. Um, and the injunctions is basically a list of uh, tenets and things. This is what the clergy should be teaching to the parishioners. Um, they write, though never get, they're never actually like published and put out um, 10 articles, which is the tenets of the Church of England. Uh, and these are very much based on some of the things coming out of the Continental Reformation. So Cromwell actually had some exposure to the Continental Reformation. Um, that'll come up again with someone else later. Um, there's, they write something called the Bishop's Book, um, which is explaining the new doctrines. Um, and then they update, I put down here the Injunctions 2.0 because they further update the injunctions. There's gonna be a lot of revisions and revising going on here. So Cranmer and Cromwell both are starting to put out things about, okay, we've made this new Church of England with the king in charge. Now, what is going to make that distinct from just the Catholic Church where our, we were already a part of before, other than the king? And then we get to the dissolution of the monasteries. This is a Cromwell project. Um, he heads this up. So the dissolution of the monasteries serves a couple of purposes. And I think most people have heard of it, which is why I'm not going to spend as much time on it. So the dissolution of the monasteries is taking apart the physical presence um, of the Catholic Church in a lot of ways. Um, so what they dismantle are your monasteries and convents, and then eventually your schools, your hospitals, things that were previously provided by the church other than the church itself. Um, they send out 
people to investigate them. So theoretically, it is to root out uh, corruption in the church. But really, they take inventories to see how much money they have. And Cromwell actually has some ideas for this money that don't match the king's. Cromwell recognizes that by taking away these monasteries and schools and hospitals, that they're serving a purpose to the populace, you know, to the lay people. And so he suggests basically that if they take all these things from the church, they can then use that for one of the first examples of a state welfare system, basically that then the government can take over doing things like caring for the poor. That's not what ends up happening. But but Cromwell sends out and they inventory and they say, look at all this money that and land that the monasteries have. So over the course of 1536 to 1541, they, through a series of laws, dismantle these these monasteries um they displace the religious that are serving in them um they take everything that's valuable and take it back to the crown so they estimate there's about 800 monasteries and convents in england when this starts that comes out to about to 12,000 to 14,000 clergy or religious of some stripe are now displaced they no longer have the home in the church that they expected to have for the rest of their lives in most cases. Um, there are executions. There's about 200 executed, um, particularly as you get later into the dissolution, you have some of the abbots of some pretty major monasteries resist. So they kill them. This is not popular with the people. Um, there is destruction of lots of art uh, as well as books. Uh, like I already said, it dismantles the schools and the hospitals. Um, this takes away the places that a lot of poorer people received services. Um, this is where you'd go to be treated if you were sick. This might be uh, how you sent your son for education. And that brings in about 1.5 million pounds to the King's coffers. They say it'd be about 500 million in modern pounds and henry gets all this money and then he decides he has time for one more war with this money which is why it doesn't go to actually replacing uh the services that have just been dismantled uh, but this is a massive impact on the catholic church's power they've lost all of these other ways that they played the role in the daily lives of people excuse me for a second so in addition to the dissolution of the monasteries and actually while it's going on um, you have something called the pilgrimage of grace pilgrimage of grace sounds very nice this ends of course in violence um, i put up this map for you so the pilgrimage of grace is not just one thing it is actually uprisings in several places so you can see on this map um there are particular monasteries that are involved those are these ones in purple um, and then you have these different routes um, so this happens over a period of time um, but you have rebels in four major groups um, and mostly in the north, because that's where all of the that's where all of the unrest happens for the most part, because the north is farther from London and farther from control. Um, this is not just about religion, though. We haven't talked about it yet, but by this time, England is in an economic crisis. Um, they don't have the language for it, you know, the concept of. The theories of economics are a little further away yet, but England is experiencing a massive population explosion 
in the 16th century and the economy is being devastated by it. Uh, they just, they have way more people than they've had before. Uh, there are lots of people who are unemployed, who can't get work. Um, when we get into Edwards, um, we're starting to see lands being enclosed that were previously available for grazing. So there's a lot of economic unrest. People are suffering in a way they weren't before. Add on to that, all these religious changes um, that are affecting them because you're dissolving the monasteries that would be giving them poor relief or would be helping them when they're sick. Um, so the pilgrimage of grace is there's about 40,000 people over these groups. And what they want is they want to stop the dissolution of the monasteries. They're asking for the end of particular taxes um, that have recently been imposed, there, including there was like a tax on a certain kind of livestock. They want to stop these changes to the land laws. And they want a purge of heretics in government because the pilgrimage of grace, at least the way they phrase their argument is they're not mad at the king. They're just sure that the king is, has bad advisors. And surely if the king knew how what was going on was affecting his people, he would want to change it. Um, so it's not just religion, but you can't separate it from what's going on with religion at this point. And what I have down here at the bottom is this, this red flag. This is a representation of the banners that the pilgrimage of grace uses. Um, so they are tying things in to that religious element. Needless to say, the pilgrimage of grace does not work out the way they want it to. Um, a lot of them flee. There are executions. Uh, about 216 executed because if there's one thing you should know about 16th century England, you don't mess with a tutor. Uh, so Henry puts down this rebellion aggressively. And then he gets back to what he's worried about. So we should stop here. So we're getting up to 1536. So while the, while the dissolution of the monasteries, is, right if the dissolution of monasteries is going on in between the second succession act and the third, we're going to have the fall of Cromwell. But first of all, so Anne Boleyn got her head chopped off. Henry marries Jane Seymour and he finally gets that son that he's been desperately hoping for. And here we have a nice little portrait of Edward VI as a baby because when you're that important, they paint portraits of you as a baby. Um, so he needs a new succession act because the last succession act said that the next in the line of succession was Elizabeth. So second succession act in 1536, um, Henry puts in a fail safe here. So Henry gets it. It says that he has the authority that if, if something were to happen to Edward, um, he can choose his successor in the, basically in either issuing letters patent or his will if he does happen to die without a clear heir. We got another oath. No. Got to have the subjects promise that, yes, you know, they, they recognize that this act. So it is declared high treason to interrupt this succession to say that his previous marriages or offspring are legitimate. So you can't even say he was legitimately married to Catherine or Anne and that Elizabeth and Mary are legitimate. You can't say that his marriage to Jane Seymour or any offspring are illegitimate. Um, it is treason to refuse to take the oath required by this act it is treason to criticize Thomas More being put to death. You wouldn't have to say that if it wasn't a problem. It is, it is treason to try to repeal this act. 
Um, and if you do try to interrupt the succession at any point, you forfeit your claim to the throne, if you have any. So between here and the Third Succession Act, um, Cromwell falls because Cromwell is involved in the negotiation of the marriage to Anne of Cleves. And of course, Henry's all excited and based on the portrait. Anne of Cleves gets there. Henry goes, ew, I didn't want to marry that. And so Cromwell gets executed. This is the only execution I'm actually aware of that Henry later goes, gosh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe it wasn't worth chopping the head off a guy who was really pretty useful to me. So, of course, by 1543, Henry has married again, chopped another wife's head off, married again, and he's married to Catherine of Pars. So he needs one more succession act. And that is, he, re he establishes the line of succession as Edward and any of Edward's children, any children that Henry and Catherine might have. And Hen Henry is still planning ahead because if he were to get married again, any children he would have with that wife, and only after all that would it be Mary or Elizabeth. And it doesn't fully legitimize Mary and Elizabeth. Um, their succession is allowed for, but there are like conditions. Uh, like anybody they marry has to be approved. Well, Henry doesn't last much longer after that. He, he finally dies in 1547. And if with his will, he says, it's Edward, then Mary, then Elizabeth, and then the Gray family. Uh, they'll come back up again. Um, there is a little bit of conflict with his will because it was not actually signed. So that gets brought up later when we're discussing this succession. But finally, Henry's part of the Reformation is over because he's dead. And you can see he doesn't do a lot with the Reformation later in his reign. But now we have the Regency of Edward VI and the Edwardian Reformation. So I love this image and I'm going to show it to you while we talk about the the beginning of Edward's reign. So Edward is a child um, when he comes to the throne. He is not old enough to rule, which means that it's going to be a regency. And it just so happens, thanks to um, the change of the supremacy, that most of the powerful people who are in line to be regent for Edward are Protestants. Um, so I love this. This is the allegory of the Reformation. So there's Henry on his deathbed, passing the throne over to his son, Edward. And here's all the other guys who are going to play a role in Edward's reign. Because Edward's regency, it's originally supposed to be a council, supposed to be a group of guys. Um, it's, it's all Protestant. And very quickly, one person rises to power. Um, and you see here, we are continuing the subjugation of the Pope. We are continuing to destroy relics of England's Catholic past. So the guy who first rises to power and quickly becomes uh, Edward's first regent is Edward Seymour. So this is his maternal uncle. This is Jane Seymour's brother. Um, and the other person who is still playing a role here, the only Thomas who survived Henry's reign is Cranmer. And Thomas Cranmer is still cranking stuff out. So one of the first things that happens after Edward is king and Edward, is, Edward Seymour is his regent is they repeal a whole bunch of stuff that Henry put into place. So remember all those things that were treason under Henry? Shoop, gone. Uh, they abolish all treasons. And so anything that was treason 
except what was in the original 1351 Treason Act. And what's in 1351 is what you'd expect. You can't plot against the crown. Uh, you know, you can't plot against or kill the king or his heir. Um, you, you can't rape the king's wife or his eldest daughter. Uh, you can't, you know, it's, it's the things you would expect to be treason. You can't copy the privy seal symbol. You can't copy the king's seal. So, and they also abolished all the things that were created as felonies under Henry that were new. Because they think Henry kind of went a little out there. They do create new treasons, but they're still less severe than under Henry. So if you deny the supremacy, you deny that the crown is the head of the Church of England in speech. It's only a misdemeanor the first time, but if you keep doing it, the next time it's a felony, and then the third time it's treason. And you're likely to get your head chopped off or, you know, whatever the appropriate execution style is for your social status, because getting your head chopped off is for important people. If you deny it in writing, that's treason right away. Uh, of course, it's treason to depose the king or his successors, deny the legitimacy of the crown, interrupt the succession. What is new is treason now requires two witnesses. This is a new thing in English law. It has not happened before. They don't have to be witnesses to the same act, but two people have to confirm that you did some one of these things before you can be executed for treason. So while that's going on over there, Cranmer and some of his other uh, clergymen are continuing to crank stuff out. So he puts out the first book of homilies. Now the ho book of homilies is actually, it is basically a set of sermons. Here is what our English clergy in the church of England should be preaching. Uh, we put out the Book of Common Prayer, and the Book of Common Prayer is the official liturgical book. Pretty much all you need to go with to be doing this Church of England thing is you need the Bible, you need a Psalter for your songs, and you need the Book of Common Prayer. Your calendar is in there, your daily offices, which they've reduced to just a morning and evening prayer. Um, the sacraments that they've kept, communion, baptism, confirmation, catechism, that's all in there. They did leave something out in 1549, and they have to make an addition. Um, they have to add ordination because they forgot to put in how you ordain new priests. Um, there's another revision of the Book of Common Prayer that comes out in 1552 that is even more like things you're seeing coming out of the Continental Reformation. Um, and they draft something called the 42 articles. And these are, again, we mentioned the 10 articles before. Well, now we're up to 42. Of uh, These are the tenets um, of what is this faith. But we don't fully even get that out there because of Edward's death. Edward doesn't live very long. So remember that we're in an economic crisis. We're still in an economic crisis. We're still having problems with unemployment. Uh, we're having problems with taxes. We're having problems with land enclosure. And people are still upset about the religious changes. So in 1549, there are multiple rebellions that happen over the summer. These all overlap. These are happening in different areas at pretty much the same time. Um, excuse me, let me have another drink. So in Cornwall and Devon, you have something called the Prayer Book Rebellion. And this is largely your gentry and your lower classes. There's about 7,000 people, 2,000 of them are killed. In Buckingham and Oxford, you have a different group of rebels. We're not really sure how many there's about 200 who end up being executed. 
And these are also mostly lower class. These are farmers, artisans, and parish priests that have an uprising. In Norfolk, you have about 16,000 rebels. About 3,000 of them are killed. This is also largely like farmers and peasants. Um, so these are, this is fairly common people all at the same time in different areas rebelling against what is going on in England. And the handling of these rebellions, you know, it is what actually brings an end to the regency of, of Edward Seymour. He loses his position as a regent with how he handles these. And the only other thing I wanted to bring up before we get to the important thing about the changing is one of the last important acts we get with regard to the Reformation is we have the Act of Uniformity in 1549 that says the Book of Common Prayer is the sole legal form of worship in England. You can't use anything else. And if you are a clergy member who tries to use anything else and you get caught, you will be punished. If you get caught three times, you will be imprisoned for life. We are not fooling around here. We are serious about this. So we have gone from Henry, who kind of did the Reformation for his own secular goals, to Edward's regency. And Edward, by the, by the time he's a little older, before he dies, we are serious about this Protestant thing. And we are really trying to create a Protestant England. And the only reason I need to bring up the second region is because of what comes next. So I said, Seymour Falls. The next person who takes charge and, and Edward VI Regency is John Dudley. Now, John Dudley um, doesn't play an important role in much else in the Reformation, except that he is the main advisor when Edward falls ill with what they think is probably tuberculosis now. So he is the advisor who, main advisor who talks Edward into writing what's called his device for the succession. It's intended to supersede Henry VIII's Third Succession Act and decides that he's going to skip his half-sisters and he is going to name as his heirs Fran the, the heirs of Francis, the Duchess of Suffolk. Um, most, um, a number of historians say that basically he gets Francis Brandon to give up her place in the succession in favor of her children. So why does John Dudley want the throne to go to the Greys? Because John Dudley's son, Guildford, is married to Jane Grey, or is about to be married to Jane Grey, depending on the exact timing. So Dudley is maneuvering to be the father-in-law of a queen and the grandfather of kings and queens. So that's the only reason why you need to know who John Dudley is, because it doesn't it make way more sense if you know why he wants the crown to go to Lady Jane Grey? Well, this is Frances Brandon, the one who we just said gave up her succession in favor of her daughter, uh, Lady Jane Grey, who actually was Lady Jane Dudley by the time this happens. Long story, very short. Um, Jane Grey is declared queen. Um, and then probably just because of who was present in the council at the time that Edward died and Jane was crowned queen. Basically, the advisors kind of turn on her and decide that they should go with Mary instead. So Jane is queen for nine days, uh, if she's really queen at all, and then is imprisoned along with her husband in the Tower of London while 
Mary is queen, Edward's half-sister. So Mary is Catholic. Mary was born Catholic. Um, she has stayed steadfastly Catholic through all of these changes, including there is a story where supposedly at one time Edward, you know, not long before he died, you know, basically gets together with her for Christmas. And her little teenage snot of a king brother actually like chides her for daring to stay Catholic and for following the old religion. Um, so we now have Mary and everybody knows there is no question in anyone's mind that Mary wants to return to Catholicism. So she becomes queen and she gets started right away. So they call this the Marian Restoration. She passes the first statute of repeal, says all that religious legislation passed under my brother, it's gone. It's all nullified, all gone. Then she passes the Treason Act. So you remember I just went through that list of things that Edward said were treason now, gone. Get rid of them. Only that original 1351 Treason Act is valid. Any felony created since the beginning of my father's reign, gone. Take it off. It doesn't take as long to explain what Mary did because she just gets rid of things. She passes a second statute of repeal. Any religious legislation against the papacy, so basically against Catholicism, from 1529 to the end of Henry VIII's reign, get rid of it. Except she doesn't technically give up supreme head of the Church of England. She doesn't end up doing anything with it, but she doesn't get rid of it. So then, there now here is finally something that she does differently. She says, you know what? I think there's a lot of heretics in England, and I don't have the tools I need to deal with them. I am going to revive heresy acts from previous crowns so that I can use them to suppress heresy and punish heretics. We'll get to that in a minute. So obviously the other main concern of Mary besides kicking off, you know, getting back to Catholicism as fast as she possibly can is Mary needs an heir. Um, Mary has been declared illegitimate so often. She's not been married off to anyone. Um, she's in her later 30s when she becomes queen. So if she doesn't want the throne to go to her sister Elizabeth, she needs to get on this thing. And her advisors beg her to pick an English husband. They even propose, uh, so the guy in red here, this is Reginald Pole, uh, Cardinal Pole, who the Pope sends to England basically to help her with the restoration. They even suggest him. Uh, doesn't go well. Their other main most eligible bachelor of England is Edward Courtenay, the first Earl of Devon over here. And he's not supposed to be a particularly nice guy to begin with. Um, that he doesn't actually have a lot to offer. He's loud and obnoxious and not very pleasant. And Mary is not interested in either of them. In fact, what Mary wants is she wants to marry her cousin Philip, her maternal cousin Philip. So Philip is over here with the uh, paternoster all dressed elegantly in black. Um, and he is soon to be Philip II of Spain. He's already the king of Sicily. You know, he's got a whole list of places that he is ruling. And the English don't really want this. Um, they don't want a foreign prince. They're really scared of what it means to have their queen, a woman is supposed to be subordinate to their husband, married to someone who is not English. 
And the guy who gets the lucky task of negotiating this after Mary says, nope, sorry, I'm marrying Philip, is Stephen Gardner right here. Uh-huh. He, is, he is also uh, an important advisor who had been around for a while during Henry's reign and comes back under Mary's. So he is the lucky guy who gets to try to negotiate this marriage. And explicitly, Wyatt's Rebellion that breaks out in 1554 is explicitly in opposition to Mary wanting to marry Philip. So the plan, and I'm not even going to go into who all's involved in it. The plan is we're going to start rebellions in multiple counties at once. We're going to start rebellions in Kent, Devon, Leicestershire, and Herefordshire. And then we're all going to march on London. We're going to depose Mary, maybe kill her. Um, and then we're going to crown Elizabeth. And then we're going to make Mary, make Elizabeth marry Courtenay, who we just said, the Earl of Devon, who doesn't have a lot going for him. Um, France is going to provide naval support because one of their rebels is the French ambassador. This thing is filled. There are all kinds of nobles included in this thing. I only listed for you some relevant nobles that you might want to know about. Thomas Wyatt, who it's named for. And then I want you to notice the next three. Gray. The surname of all three of these is Gray. This is Jane Gray's father and her uncles. Because... Jane Grey hasn't been executed yet. Mary really didn't want to kill her. Um, she's friends, actually, with Lady Jane Grey's mother. Um, so Wyatt's Rebellion in 1554 falls apart. Three of those rebellions in the four counties don't even happen. Wyatt is the only one who gets anywhere. Um, he actually does manage to take some cities and he marches to London and Mary shows up in the London Guild Hall and she makes a stirring speech and the citizens of London repel him. So Wyatt obviously gets beheaded and quartered. Um, Courtenay actually just gets exiled, but he dies soon after in Italy. Um, and then... Jane Grey's father and one of her uncles get executed and it directly leads to the decision that Mary finally makes that she has to execute Jane Grey and her husband because they're too much of a threat. They're too much of a rallying point if she keeps them alive. And perhaps important, it's, second importance only to that Elizabeth very nearly gets killed. Um, Elizabeth, because she is clever, manages to talk her way out of it, but she is seriously interrogated. She is suspected of being privy to this plot that was going to make her queen. Um, she is imprisoned for about two months, and then she is kept under house arrest. And Mary gives serious consideration to whether she's going to have to execute her half sister. So, but Mary goes forward because Philip checks a lot of her boxes. A, he's not English, so he wasn't just mean to her for a good portion of her life while she was illegitimate. Um, and he's Catholic and, you know, related to family that's been good to her. So, Mary finally does marry Philip. And the big thing is we have to have an act of parliament that says, yes, okay, Philip will be recognized as king for the duration of their marriage. So like official documents will go out in their name. Uh, Mary's going to, you know, he'll technically be a co-ruler, but Mary's going to retain primary authority and he can't act without her permission. He can't. We can't appoint any foreigners to office. Mary and any offspring of the marriage can't be taken outside of England. And Philip has no place in the succession. And then 
as if the English aren't worried enough, Pope Paul the Fourth actually puts out a papal bull saying, that's right, I recognize Philip and Mary as the legitimate king and queen of England and all its dominions. By the way, I want my stuff back from the dissolution. And if anything happens to Mary, that Elizabeth shouldn't be next. This is probably why, combined with the next slide, Mary gets a bad rap. So in addition to an unpopular marriage, um, you know, these rebellions, Mary's religious policies. So when she takes the throne, she immediately releases a bunch of Catholic prisoners and trades them for a bunch of Protestants, um, including Thomas Cranmer. Thomas Cranmer survived Henry VIII. He's not going to survive Mary. Um, she reinstates celibacy for priests. So priests had been allowed to marry all of a sudden. A bunch of them did. Um, she reinstates celibacy. And if you were a priest who got married, you get booted. You've lost your job. You have no income. Um, she reestablishes the relationship with the Pope and she starts persecuting Protestants. She starts executions in 1555. It's largely burnings at the stake. And about 800 more um, English Protestants flee outside of England. And we get lots and lots of nice propaganda here. Um, so Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, uh, this is a bishop being burned. Um, yeah. She doesn't kill that many people compared to the other tutors necessarily but she does it in such a short compressed time and it's not it's not executions that enough of the people are in favor of this is how she gets to be bloody mary so here is our burning of thomas cranmer but mary doesn't last very long she dies, and unlike her brother Edward, when she dies, she does not try to skip her sister. She does not try to sit on the throne anywhere else. She begrudgingly says, okay, fine. Elizabeth is the next successor to me, and she should be crowned. So we get to the reign of Elizabeth I. Now, Elizabeth undertakes something that they refer to now as the Elizabethan settlement. And this is a set of laws between 1558 and 1563 uh, laws and decisions that say, okay, we've been kicking around this church of England thing. We've been separated from the Pope since the 1530s. We've had some publications and then they've been reversed and we've had some decisions and then they get changed. We're going to decide what is the Church of England. So big fancy name for we have another act of supremacy in 1558. It clarifies the definition of heresy and in the process of doing so, it narrows it. So less things are heretical. It confirms Elizabeth as the supreme governor of the Church of England. Head was too controversial. Governor seems more okay for a woman. Um, and they choose, she chooses to use governor. It is a crime to assort the authority of any foreign entity, parentheses, we're talking about the Pope now. And the third offense is considered high treason. An oath of supremacy is required for church or public office. And we'll get to the oath of supremacy in a second. And then we have the Act of Uniformity. So the Act of Uniformity repeals Mary's first statute of repeal. It restores the religious legislation that Edward VI had passed, including the Book and Prom and Prayer and Administration of Sacraments. It says, yes, the Order of Prayer and the Book and Common Prayer is what we're going to use. What is in the Book of Common Prayer is what our churches and services should look like it does make church attendance compulsory but the fine is not 
crushing. It is a fine. Um, it forbids the attendance of Catholic mass and does penalize going to Catholic mass with a large fine and then more severe punishments for the priests. Elizabeth's general approach at this point is she cares about public conformity. If you follow the rules and do what you're supposed to and are a good member of the Church of England in public, she's not necessarily worried. She says she doesn't want to put windows into people's souls. She wants you to comply. And she wants to make it easy. She wants peace. So here is the oath of supremacy that is required of anyone who wants to hold a church or public office. You know, we've seen a lot of these oaths at this point, but basically you have to say, yup, she's, she's the supreme governor of the church and I forsake any foreign jurisdiction. We're talking about the Pope. The Elizabethan settlement, the other part of it, in addition to those laws, is she reinstitutes those royal injunctions. Those are 57, basically, regulations regarding religion. There is a new edition of the Book of Common Prayer that takes some things from the 1549 and some things from the 1552 version and puts them together. Um, the th Remember the 10 articles and then the 42 articles? We finally settle it into the 39 articles and we get an act of parliament passed that says these are the doctrines and faith of the Church of England and these are its practices in 1571. Um, then we have another act that establishes how we ordain ministers and says that if you're, if you're going to be a minister, you have to adhere to these 39 articles of religion. Um, we also get the publication of a second book of homilies. So basically 20 more, more, 21 more approved sermons that you can say, and they're on different occasions or particular popular topics. But now we have two books of homilies. We have a new edition of the Book of Common Prayer, and we've really set out, this is what the Church of England believes. However, there are people who are not happy because Elizabeth is still Protestant. And this is, this is obviously a big problem for people who are very deep in their Catholic faith. And most of the next rebellions we're going to talk around about are all going to revolve around Mary, Queen of Scots, because she becomes the Catholic centerpiece of these plots against Elizabeth. So Elizabeth has established what the Church of England looks like, but it doesn't mean her dealing with the Reformation is over because she's still dealing with the conflicts over should England be Protestant. So we have the Rising of the North or the Revolt of the Northern Earls in 1569. So this plan, we're going to dispose Elizabeth we're going to crown Mary, Queen of Scots, who has been in exile from Scotland and living in England in prison since 1567. And we're going to marry her to Thomas Howard, the fourth Duke of Norfolk. So they do occupy some places, but then um, Elizabeth sends out an army that's much bigger and they all go, whoa, that looks like we're going to get killed. And they run. So she declares martial law in the North and very harshly comes down on them. Because as we discussed, one of the rules of the 16th century is don't mess with a tutor. Uh, she executes about 750 or more people. However, we're not done. In 1570, a new Pope, Pope Pius V, says Elizabeth is a heretic who's been persecuting the Catholics. She is excommunicated. 
you don't have to listen to her if you're in, in England. Not only do you not have to listen to her, if you don't rebel against her, you're excommunicated too. So if you don't rebel against Elizabeth, your immortal soul is in peril. So now, wait, this plot may sound familiar. Now we're going to assassinate Elizabeth. This is the Rodolfi plot in 1571. We're going to, again, crown Mary, Queen of Scots. We're going to marry her to Thomas Howard, the fourth Duke of Norfolk. Same guy we were going to marry her to in the last plot. This also involves, we're also going to have the Duke of Alba invade from the Netherlands. We're going to incite a rebellion in the northern counties of England because they're always the problems anyway. This plot implicates the Spanish ambassador, it implicates Thomas Howard, um, Mary Queen of Scots, Philip of Spain, the Duke of Alba, and the Pope is in on it. The Pope supports this. So we have another rebellion. This one doesn't really get off the ground. There's too many people. So then we have the Throckmorton plot in 1581. So you see, it's, it's not over. The conflict is not done. This plot may sound familiar. Now we're going to use a Spanish invasion to depose Elizabeth and crown Mary Queen of Scots. This doesn't work out either. They get caught. Then in 1586, we have the Babington plot. We're going to have another Spanish invasion. We're going to use that to either depose or assassinate Elizabeth. And then we're going to crown Mary Queen of Scots. And this is the one that finally gets Mary Queen of Scots executed. Because they actually have proof in the form of letters that says, yeah, Mary endorsed this. She was good with it. So you can see there's still this, even though in some minds it's settled, it's not settled yet. Elizabeth being Protestant is still a problem. Which is why we get a couple more acts that I'm going to talk about as we go out. So you have priests, particularly Jesuits and folks, trying to sneak into England, trying to convert English to Catholicism, convince them to rebel. So in 1584, you get an act against Jesuits, seminary priests, and other like disobedient persons. If you're a Roman Catholic priest in England, you have to leave or you have to swear an oath to obey the queen in 40 days. If you're currently abroad and were educated, if you're an Englishman abroad who was educated in a Jew Jesuit seminary, you have to come back within the next six months. And then as soon as you hit land, hit England, you have to swear an oath within two, within two days of arriving that you're going to obey the queen. If you take that oath, even though you've promised to obey the queen, you can't be within 10 miles of the queen for the next 10 years without her explicit written permission. Oh, and by the way, it's illegal to harbor or even hide the presence of a priest. If you know a priest is in your, a Catholic priest is in your neighborhood, you have to report it to the authorities or you can be charged. So I just bring up two more. We've got to have a religion act, imprisonment without bail for failure to attend church, convincing others not to go to church, denying the crown's authority in religious matters, attending illegal religious meetings. You can be exiled. You can be fined for harboring recusants, which are basically um, Catholics who refuse to go to Church of England services. And we have a Popish Recusants Act where Roman Catholic recusants cannot move more than five miles from your home or you could have to forfeit all your property. So this battle is still going on through the end of our period is really what I want to impress upon people is just because the laws of what is the Church of England may be settled, this is not settled um, while Elizabeth is on the throne. But I finish it up with 
our lovely allegory of the Tudor succession, that did not go any with it, anywhere near the way Henry expected it to when it all kicked off. So, uh, just to conclude, to talk for a minute about what makes this different than what happened on the continent. Um, for one thing, uh, a number of scholars have done research. Um, the Continental Reformation in 1517 really kicks off um, partially as a result of a lot of corruption in the church in what becomes Germany. Um, there's not a lot of evidence that the English church was anywhere near um, that kind of corrupt. Um, it just, that wasn't what was going on there. Um, the Reformation obviously occurs in a much different fashion. Um, the, the role that ju just a king um, doing this as opposed to you know, in some of the continental Europe, you have these wars of religion where you have different neighboring rulers fighting over religion. Well, you don't, you don't have that. Um, it, it just, the Reformation looks very different in England than it does really anywhere else. Um, and I hope that that was very educational for all of you. I hope it wasn't too painful because that was a lot of stuff in an hour and a half. Um, if people have questions, um, you can feel free to ask. I will happily tell you if I don't know. Uh, it was an adventure to create this class. It's the hardest I've worked on a class in a very long time. Um, I don't know, uh, Antonio, I see about the, did the armies go rogue in Sacrum in 1527? And the Pope had a Spanish army breathing down his neck. Yeah. Yeah, he was way more worried about Charles than he was ever going to be about Henry. Please feel free to say something. I've been talking for an hour and a half, people. Well, thank you. It's been, I actually have a question, but I really enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you. I, I hope it helps that I tried to do some uh, organization and stuff. Oh, thank you. And Catherine, you, oh, you didn't have anything to do with the Rockmorton plot. I, I'm glad to hear that. Oh, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it very much. Next, if I have to do this in person, I think I need puppets or a felt board or something. Um, Cause that's the only Thank way we're gonna keep much. up. Hmm? Thank you very much. You're welcome. It was very, very good. Thank you. Thank you.